The eyes of the college football world were on Georgia and Tennessee when they played last year. Still a primetime game, still meaningful in the SEC, but the difference this year, Brent, we know the SEC's champ, Georgia's in. They're going to play Alabama in the SEC championship game. Wasn't the case last year. Georgia, though, does have to go to Neyland Stadium, which is never an easy thing to do. You know, Tennessee fans want to play spoiler and be the first Georgia loss in quite a long time. But the last loss that Tennessee had in Neyland Stadium was to Georgia two years ago. So this this is going to be a big game for the Volunteers. We're here to show everyone the difference of the Volunteers this year, maybe as compared to last year, because I think everyone remembers last year of throwing the ball over the field, big, long touchdowns against Alabama with Jalen Hyatt. And that's not this team. This is more of a, a run-focused team. Yeah, and that's where they're the best players, right? Running back, Samson, you know, th those guys are the best players. Milton is a runner, I think, is going to be big in this game against Georgia. But like you said, I think the biggest thing is it's at home for Tennessee. This is this is a spoiler. They just got their tail kicked by Missouri. It's you know, This is a se sort of season, you know, get right, feel good, all that sort of stuff about this game, especially if they can end the streak uh, that's going on uh, for Georgia. They might need a little bit more feel good after it was not a, a great performance against Missouri as a whole. We'll touch on that some. We're looking at two games here that Tennessee has played, Alabama and Missouri. All right, so first, um, let, let's get in here and talk about just some of this run action and, and everything in this offense that, that Joe Milton leads. Well, and Milton's been solid. But in terms of look at his overall grade, his passing grade, it's out of the 10 QBs that have – played significant snaps in the SEC, he's 10th. Uh, so it's a lot of you see the ability, you see the flashes. We're going to show some of the flashes, throws that literally only th he in college football I think can make. And he probably – some of the NFL guys that throws that they can't make. But just re-watching both the Bama game, I, I watched Kentucky, uh, Missouri obviously uh, this past weekend, and, and I think one more, the, a, little bit of, a little bit of Florida just to see some of the struggles – but they should have been up 21 to nothing against Alabama. Like if it wasn't for a one little miss throw and then a drop or, you know, a little bit of here, they would have been up 21, nothing early in the second quarter and had an absolute stranglehold of this game. They so, were close know, to flawless offensively in that first quarter. Close to. Yeah. If, if, if it wasn't for a couple plays in the low red zone that were missed, like they're in this game, but the biggest thing rewatching all those games is I think they should live in this formation. We traditionally see Tennessee with the double stack, really, really wide receivers. This is more of a, it's a wider still version of, of two by two, but double twins. I think this is where and and run this type of RPO game. I think if you're, if you're going to have consistent success against Georgia, because we looked at it before the season. Tennessee's points per game against everybody else in the SEC was up in the upper 30s, and then Georgia was in the teens. Like They have defended them well over the past uh, few years. These are things to me that could potentially put Georgia in a little bit of conflict where you spread them out, make them balance out for the most part, and then attack and make them wrong. If they shoot, play the run, you throw it. They play the pass, you run it. This is why they space the way that they do, just because you create a lot of space here. And I would assume this would be a Tyke Smith, potentially. Uh, in this one, he'd be in the top. I think this is actually Dallas Turner. Uh, so that's the edge edge defender at the bottom of the screen. Ah. I think 15, I want to say. All right. No, 41. Braswell, the other edge. Yeah. Uh, Chris Braswell. So, you know, finding ways to spread them out, making them balance, and, and then, you know, hit, hit this. Because he does have a quick release and can be accurate at certain points because like we see right here like this like this like that's the thing with Milton when you think about okay what's the recipe for a an upset type deal it's that guy has the game of his life and just is on the money all game long because he can now does he do it consistently no that's why the the stats are the way they are that's why they've struggled in in the ways that they have but in terms of ability, you know, this is – it's there. Ability and confidence. Tennessee will take shots down the field. Yes. Georgia defensive backs are going to be running backwards. They're going to be needing to make plays. They're going to be needing to avoid pass interference penalties. 
Tennessee stresses the back end of your defense, or at least attempts to. With throws like this, there's not a thing you can do. Nope. Just phenomenal football. And Georgia played a little bit of this against Ole Miss. Ole Miss was throwing the ball downfield in one-on-one situations quite often. So yeah, and this is a teams new that, Georgia. And the teams that have had success against Georgia take those chances. Uh, and just if you if you can get some sustained success, the key for him for Milton this year is on these 20 plus yard throws, he's at 28% completion right now. Yeah. Eight touchdowns, four picks. And so this is one of the touchdowns uh, versus last year with Hooker. That was almost 50%, 13 touchdowns, one pick, just a little bit different. Now, in terms of talking about arm, this throw, ooh, like opposite hash to the complete other sideline and almost feels like it was accelerating at the end, not not barely getting there. Third and eight play. Like I said, that's it's just – it's so tough to cover. I think Kirby talked about it in his uh, press conference uh, today where he mentioned, you know, hey, you think the ball's not on you as a DB because it's not normally, but with this guy, it's there. That's an and NFL throw. I mean, yes. that, and there's some NFL players that can't make that throw. Correct. 100%. And that's, again, and by the way, what do we do? We show the possibilities of things and what might happen. Now, this is this is the, you know, their first and 20, trying to get back sort of into uh, in a manageable situation. And I think more than anything, that's what Hypo's offense, and we talked about this last year when we previewed the game last year. Their offense thrives on being ahead of schedule and getting first down so then they can tempo you to death. Well, what are they going to do? They're going to run the quarterback. Like I said, uh, he had 10 carries for 92 yards, I think, uh, in this game. And a lot of it was true design runs. And he's an athlete. And then if you – they spread you out so much, you make one wrong decision, linebacker, they're 32. Like, and now he goes the opposite way. He's I a see, dynamic. I, Go ahead. I, I see this consistently. I just – I think – I think he gets double digit carries against Georgia. And I think he should if they want to stay around in the game and, and, and stay competitive with, with it. He's a dynamic runner. He's also a physical runner. No problem finding contact. Six, what is he, six, five, six, six, like 200 yeah. plus. I mean, he's a big dude. Let's get to some running back action here because they're, that's an impressive bunch. So that play happened. And then we had the second down play. Again, they're going tempo because you can still see the, the home, the home depot, depot, like the, the lovely. I'm just a fan. Just a replay. I'm look. That that is a state of Georgia company. I know some people that work free, at the free, course. Free advertising for them, right there. Well, you know. So then they hit you, and six, and this six was the more effective back against Bama, and you know. So now, ooh, okay, boom. They're rolling tempo. Get a little bit of block. Blocking has not been a strength in terms of overall pass block or run block. They are 11th out of the 14 teams in terms of PFF grade uh, overall. And I think a lot of that is 87 and 34 at tight end or not what 88 was a year ago for them. But, again, tempo, moving, hitting you quick. you got to get lined up. If you're not, you make a spot or you miss a tackle because their backs are good. Now they're rolling again on first down. Overall, I wouldn't say that Tennessee has the skill players, the quality of skill players that it had last season. They're good. Um, but this is a good route here to come back and help the quarterback. Yeah, again, going tempo, going fast. And this is because of Milton's ability to throw this. What was, I think, one of the biggest differences in the game a season ago with, with Georgia and Tennessee was every ball that they threw to the outside like this, Hooker ended up throwing it high. Yep. And you got no yards after the catch in that game. Ringo, uh, Lasseter, you know, as soon as they were catching it, turn around, boom, guys were tackling because they had people in, in Hooker's face. They consistent, Georgia consistently blitzed them. And then the, high, the throw was high, and you can't get yards after the catch. But if you get fast, you get tempo because you're worried and trying to play the deep ball, and they hit you with this comeback. Now, we'll say there's something that we're going to show against Missouri watching – that Milton does more so, maybe way more so than Hooker did, is holds and stares. And there's potential for bigger plays going the other way. And that Missouri got one late. Uh, but it's just still, when they're going fast and they get the running game going, 
QB run or this, it, it's you know, it's tough to defend. With as wide as these receivers play in these sets can be, I do think, especially with an injury at corner for Georgia, it's going to be a stressful night. And Georgia, oh, they're, they're going to find ways to work yeah. Dalen Ever to death. Yes. Period. End of story. Like that's Tennessee fans. You're going to you're going to look up and you're going to see six the ball, ball being thrown at six a lot. And you're not going to see as much toward Kamari Lassiter. No, he's locking down players. It's it's kind of dangerous to throw that way. But I think that also means you'll probably see some more Javon Bullard coming on the trail. Yep. Uh, all right, this is a, a rollout here. So yep. we talked about this last year, and I, even before the season. Where's the evolution of their offense and some of the things? Because especially against Georgia, when you know the quarterback is going to be in a certain spot all the time, it just like, Georgia attacks that. And we saw it a year ago, and we've seen, we've seen it each of the last couple of years. More of this, I I would consistently, especially with Milton's ability to run. I, if I were Tennessee in, the, in their offense at playing against Georgia, consistently do this just to get something different to where the quarterback, because you know your you know, pass blocking is not necessarily your strength, you know they're going to blitz you, like move the pocket, do some of this, some of these things, you know, makes the play, boom. This was a great start that Tennessee had. Oh, he was, he was on fire except for this one. Yeah, th- this one hurt. Like I said, when when it's in, instead of ten, by the way, it should be fourteen because I, I forget I can't remember exactly why it was, but I know it should have been fourteen. And this is one where this is a, a pro scout's going to look at this and be like, okay, why why are we with the feet? Like, what's he doing here with the feet? You're it's a completely clean pocket. Now, are you trying to maybe get an angle to make that throw? But that's a throw that you just sit there in the pocket and put into the red towards the corner, lob it up, easy touchdown. Instead, anywhere he moves, back here. Your, yeah. your guy's going to catch it anywhere if it's thrown there. Yes. Instead, he moves his feet sort of awkwardly and still kind of throws a laser. And it's, you know, could have been caught, but it's just a hard catch. And I will say that's that's been a thing for Tennessee this year. In terms of the SEC, they're second. Uh, or Milton's second in terms of drop percentage. Leary's first, over 10%. Milton's at like 8% in terms of throws he's had drop. But, again, they should be up 21 nothing in this game in the first quarter. One thing I love, I love the play here because you get three Alabama guys in combined space all right there beside each other. And when – I mean, he throws to the right guy. just doesn't make the throw. But look here. Yep. Like multiple things coming open here because – 30 is all about sideline here to make sure that this doesn't happen. Yes, this should have been a touchdown, but you, you got Alabama spinning in circles there. You you won this play. You just didn't execute it like you should have. And you won the first half, and then you got dunked on uh, in the second half, and that success uh, did not unfor- – unfortunately did not continue. But still, it's a, a seven-point game in the fourth quarter, and then the strip sack turned it into the, the two-score in. Yeah, some untimely – turnovers here's milton and this is again I, I i think like what look what they do wide box so now there's five guys in the box and you in essence have the pulling guard is what the tight end here the h-back functions as and if you make one little wrong decision like bama's backers do here he's got a lot of open space boom 32 gets eyes sucked inside and now he's got space. Like, I, I think they're going to consistently do this. Uh, at least I think they should uh, to Georgia. Are you surprised that with the success that hype on Tennessee had the last season that we haven't seen more teams do these extremely wide splits? No, I, I really don't because I, I think it's, it's gotta be a massive part of your offense. And I also think teams aren't a lot of times as confident in, one, their quarterback to make those throws, or two, their offensive line to block in that manner. Fair. Uh, but like we, you know, we've looked at Ole Miss as well. Some of the stuff that Ole Miss did and had some success with against Georgia, Tennessee does in the run game. And the, like I said, their backs are really good. That's a keeper. Now we go over to the game against Missouri last week. Third and nine, let it fly. And, and this, like, sometimes this guy just puts it in a spot that no one else can. 
And unfortunately for them, this guy was finally starting to do some things and gets hurt. Yeah. And I think is now out for the potentially for, I think he's out for the season. R- regular season. I think postseason could be. Yeah. But when you think about Tennessee, that that's the biggest thing from this year or from last year to this year. One offensive line, not as good. Well, guess what? You lost the top 10 or 11 pick. Darn all right. At tackle and some other guys. But also, no Tillman. Brew McCoy gets hurt early in the year. He He's done. No Hyatt. Hi, like, Hyatt had 1,200-plus yards receiving. Their top two receivers right now don't even have a right, have right around 1,100. Like, you just yeah. don't have the big playability. But when you got a guy who can throw it that far and throw it like that and put it in a bucket down the field, sometimes it's just I, – I, when I remember I was watching this and thought, oh, that's incomplete. But, no, he caught it. It was great. It was a phenomenal catch. For Tennessee to be in the game with Georgia late, they're going to need plays like this. They're going to need some one-on-one things to go their way. They're going to need their quarterback to do some special things. They've done it in spurts this season. This yeah. is, I mean, we're getting the PI this calls. Team is not what it was last year, but this is still seven and three team in the SEC. Like they've played some good games. Yep, uh, and, and PI too. Like getting PI calls on this, I think that's. If Georgia can play defense without getting pass interference calls, that will obviously lend the favor. But if you get two or three, and now they they can get their running game indoor tempo going, all right, they might be putting points on the board in a hurry. We've talked exclusively so far about Tennessee's offense. We didn't want to sneak in one play about Tennessee's defense. Because this is something that Missouri did to Georgia, and that the only pressure that Ole Miss got against Georgia was in a look much like this where you've got a bunch of guys and you bring a bunch of guys standing up in line scrimmage. They do this consistently. And that's the best part of their team uh, on defense, the pass rush. Haddon, who I was actually pumping up on around the league last, last week and completely missed that he was out for, out for the season. <laughs> um, but, you know, coverage isn't, hasn't, has been a bit of an issue, but pass rush is there. Pierce, 27, nine. Like, they got some pass rushers, especially on the edge. And, that, that's where if you're talking about, hey, how, how can they slow down Georgia? How can they you know, create turnovers or do some things interesting, make this game very interesting? It's because of the pass rush. Pressure Carson Beck. How did Missouri avoid some of that? Cody Schrader was a monster, monster. in this game. Yes. Absolutely. Unreal. Oh, And if Georgia's run game and then pass two running backs as well, does anything like what Missouri's did it mitigate some of this pass rush? If Georgia gets yes, in full on drop game back mode, if, if Georgia gets full on and drop back passing mode, then Tennessee can tee off a little bit. That that'd be a worst case scenario for Georgia is drop back passing all game. Yep. Got to have all the motions. Got to have all the the other things. Um, back to offense, just because this was. I mean, you look at the score here. This game's over anyway, but it's very much over after this. Well, it's one, and the reason I wanted to include it is because. I think this could be something that happens this weekend because I'm watching the games against Kentucky and, and Bama and, and the other te- some of the other teams they played. I'm like, why aren't some of these corner because, because they don't have the high deep threat and the Tillman deep threat. So often it's the comeback routes and the shorter routes that they go to, especially the comeback routes on the outside. And he's sitting and staring oftentimes at them. I'm like, where's their pick six? The pick six coming? Nope. Pick six didn't come? Nope. And well, then finally Missouri got one. So who's going to get it? Make, make Is this Tyke Smith going right back to the well? He's been the interception guy this year. Uh, I mean, Bullard? I think it's more Starks. Starks? If I'm, if, if, in terms of just since, making, making a play on it and seeing it and reading it and seeing it. It's been a while yeah. since Malachi Starks touched the football. But he might get one on just a deep ball too. Who knows? Could be. But, you know – Milton, he's been, like I said, he's been okay. But for that offense and for that offense to really tick, it's it's a QB-driven offense. you got to be really, really good. Uh, and he needs help in that first quarter against Alabama. Squirrel White came up big multiple times and got easy yards when, you know, sideline. Like, it, it, it was making sure that you got as much yak as you could because it's hard against defenses like Georgia and Alabama – some of that template may still apply. If if Joe Milton comes out in a quarter and is just accurate, throwing dimes, yeah, George is going to struggle with that because every team struggles with that. Yep. He just so. hasn't shown the ability to do that for extended periods of time. Correct. 
hundred percent correct. And, and, you know, playing at home crowd, you get momentum, you get a big play early, who knows? Because I mean, remember the last time Georgia played at Tennessee, like the first drive of the game, they missed a wide open touchdown. Yeah. I mean, they eventually scored, but they still missed a wide open touchdown. And that's, that's, it's going to be a fascinating game to watch just because one, their offense has struggled as a whole. But like I talked about previous to the season, Georgia was the only team that had really defended them well. Do they have some level of trick up their sleeve? I think they're going to move. I think they're going to move the pocket more. I think they're going to run the QB more. I think that's how they keep consistent offense. Because they, you know, if you tempo gets you that sort of thing, but if you don't have consistent offense against Georgia and the way Georgia's offense is playing, it spells bad for teams usually. The only other thing I think worth mentioning here, just because Neyland Stadium is a really hard place to play. Tennessee fans care. They're going to pack it out. Dolly Parton's going to be there, the, yeah. the, the queen of the earth. And what's the worst game that George has played this year, Brent? Uh, I mean, South Carolina at home, but Auburn out on the road. Full game. I, that first half against South Carolina, totally get it. Yeah. What's, what's the total worst game? Yeah, Auburn. At Auburn. At Auburn. What's the road test that Georgia has had other than at Auburn? Because you look at their schedule – it's at Vandy, and it's Jacksonville where that's half of your crowd against Florida. Pretty much other than that, George has been at home. Yes. And so this – The environment is, is real. Georgia is battle-tested. I'm not saying it isn't. But Georgia hasn't faced what it's facing against Tennessee since September 30th at Auburn. And this Tennessee team is better than Auburn at that time. I don't know now. I think Auburn's playing better than it was when Georgia – got it then but i'm just that there's a path that this is closer than the experts vegas vegas what like spread is not large it's yeah 10 i think something like that but i kirby says it all the time can't ever take for granted how tough it is to win on the road in the sec well and you're and this is one of those places to do it look you're playing a team that has a good pass rush and the worst that Carson Beck has played is when he's been pressured. Most quarterbacks are that way. And he's still been mm-hmm. good. Don't get me wrong. It's all going to come down to, to Joe Milton's got to be special. And if he is, then this is going to be a game for a while. And yes. if he's not, Georgia can run away. Yep. I think it, it pretty well that simplifies down to that 100%. A couple – organizations that are always special Breda pest management the official pest control of the georgia bulldogs they protect sanford stadium they can protect your home bradapest.com also asw distillery they're distilled by dogs five of the six founders are uh uga grads and so go ahead and plan your schedule out here because georgia has back-to-back night games in the city of atlanta georgia tech 7 30 kickoff uh, and I get, I'd say night game. You're going to, I don't know exactly. Four o'clock time. usually, like, right? 4.30, something like that. Hey, look, after daylight savings, that's nighttime around, around yes. my house. Uh, Basically. So all I'm saying is there are tasting rooms all around Atlanta where you can go hang out with the folks at ASW, try some of their uh, product, whether you like the Fiddler bourbon or if you want the Hunker vodka, go check it out. I think that'll be a great opportunity to get to know ASW a little bit better. Uh, the tasting room around the battery is fun if you're up that way, but they have multiple tasting rooms. So ASW Distillery, you can learn more about them through their social media. It's been our preview of Georgia and Tennessee. Uh, gosh, we have to decide if we're doing a Georgia Georgia Tech preview. We'll think about that. Film don't lie. UGX4.